This audio production was made in collaboration with Audible Anarchist. Uncouth. A serious anarchism must also be feminist, otherwise it is a question of patriarchal half anarchism and not real anarchism. Anarchist Federation of Norway. I can only begin this chapter with a Kombahi River Collective, or the CRC's, Black Feminist Statement, as it is touted as a foundational black feminist document, having spawned terms like identity politics and given rise to intersectionality as a concept by their media meditation on interlocking oppressions. What is less remarked upon, though, is their fierce commitment to socialism. Indeed, they state very explicitly that they are socialists, but while they affirm their socialism and quote, essential agreement with Marxist theory, end quote, they disagree with a class reductionist analysis. Their socialism is not class first, it is expansive and encompasses the capacity of black feminist subjective world making. That is to say, their socialist analysis comes from the patriarchy, which is no particularity, but a capacious and broad insight into structuring mechanisms in the social milieu of the nexus of black at, and woman. That vantage, that nexus, is indeed about people who are black women, but also I want to argue about an indexation of black feminism that expansively, quote, welcomes anyone with an investment in black women's humanity, intellectual labor, and political visionary work, anyone with an investment in theorizing black genders and sexualities in complex and nuanced ways. End quote. It is a black feminism that references the nexus of black and woman, but that always transcends attempts to limit the tradition by rooting it in embodied performances. It is, in short, a black feminism that is, first and foremost, an anti-captivity project. The CRC's notion of interlocking oppressions understands that all the systems and discourses that contain and curtail us, what anarchists would loosely understand as the state and authority, are connected. The synthesis of these oppressions is what they understand as the state. Thus, their political aim of the destruction of the political economic systems of capital and imperialism as well as patriarchy is an anarchic politic destruction of the state which is understood robustly as being attended by racial gendered and imperialist baggage is an attempt at moving toward an anarchist society the state and the governmental material ills of the world are a product of white male rule that they feel viscerally there is no saving it through and through it is toxic no reforming white male rule so it becomes appropriate on a certain reading to see white male rule as not merely about people who are white and cis men at the top though this is certainly very much the case but as a name for the oppressiveness of the state and authority. State and authority are metonymized by reference to white male rule, which the CRC, as black and woman, as operating through black feminism, feels acutely and wants no part of. They are uninterested in seizing the state or capital. They are uninterested in flipping the racialized and gendered script and becoming the master class. Quote, we reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking ten paces behind. End quote. They write in their statement, to be, quote, recognized as human, levelly human, is enough. End quote. A horizontal, mutually aiding, radically non-hierarchical world is what they seek. An anarchic world. I know, I know, they don't call themselves anarchists, but as stated at the outset of this volume, I care little about only claiming black people, and in this case, black women who deem themselves anarchists. I care little too about bringing people into the institutional folds of anarchism. What strikes me about the CRC is how their socialism, which critiques socialism, expands socialism, moves by way of anarchic principles and forces. They radicalize their socialism by anarchizing it, in other words. If anarchists hold that quote until all are free, then none is free, we can note the expression 
we can note the expression anarchism of the CRC when they argue that if black women were free, it would mean that everyone else would have to be free since our freedom would necessitate the destruction of all the systems of oppression. This demonstrates as Kianga Yamohata Taylor writes, I probably got that wrong, uh, the dialectic connecting the struggle for black liberation to the struggle for a liberated United States and ultimately the world. This is all to say something quite profound. Black radical feminisms with their embedded queer and trans circulatory systems refuse subsumption into neoliberal markets or mainstream notions of revolution. They reject the creation of another nation state. They reject a female headed ruling class. It is a radical feminism for the 99% which is quote far from celebrating women CEOs who occupy corner offices. We want to get rid of CEOs and corner offices. End quote. It continually questions, refusing an endpoint or knowable future. It is quotidian practice that in suspending the knowability of the intricacies of an anarchic vision allows for an anarchic world to arise in as much as the anarchic world defines intelligible elaborations, elaborations predicated on the world as such. Though anarchism is a method of praxis of thought, method and praxis of thought that is non hierarchical, there has nevertheless been an insistent sexism within many anarchist circles. Indeed, the first self proclaimed anarchist, Proudhon, is noted as having said that when one compares sex with sex, women are inferior. Proudhon and many of his followers retained the sense that the father held a legitimate position of power, an instantiation of a masculine, tough, honorable, and independent affect, and that women, unfortunately so, were, quote, chained to nature and entered society only through heterosexual marriage. A kind of anarcho-sexism has been a repeated current in anarchist movements and theories. But while Proudhon's belief that woman's role is essentially to be the subordinated right hand to her husband, others like French anarcho-communist Joseph de Jacques state firmly that feminism and anarchism are inextricable. Anarchism and feminism have a fraught history because still, while most male anarchist writers, like many leftist men in general, give lip service to the equality of the sexes, groups of women within the movement's ranks had to fight for anything resembling equality. I assert unequivocally that anarchism must be feminist. Furthermore, what I pose in this chapter is an explicitly black feminist anarchism, an anarcho-blackness, where the blackness is necessarily and fundamentally, as it must always be in whatever realm, feminist. Following the CRC, the anarchist revolution can only become actualized if it is a feminist and anti-racist revolution, which is to say, succinctly, Anarchism that is not black feminist is not doing anarchic work. The approach toward the world that is classified under the heading of anarcho-feminism finds early rumblings as an identifiable political movement during the Spanish Civil War in 1936 by Mujeres Libres, or Free Women, but in various less defined iterations centuries before this. Though something people called themselves and their collective organizations anarcho-feminism didn't really appear until the 1970s. Put simply, anarcho-feminism has critiqued the pervasive sexism and gendered hierarchies within anarchist movements. Historically, it was difficult for anarcho-feminists to emerge legibly as there existed a simplistic political binarism between one on one hand anti-state feminist liberalism, which saw the state as a potential source of despotism, but that embraced free market capitalism, and on the other hand, pro-state socialist slash feminist radicalism, which, while sharing anarchism's predominant economic philosophy, also embraced women's suffrage and their entry into the machinery of the state. Anarcho-feminism needed to emerge as a radical and anti-state In many ways, anarcho-feminists understood anarchism as a type of feminism due to its avowed rejection of hierarchies and authority. Uh, 
As noted, a persistent underlying sexism was present within anarchism, many collectives being characterized by quasi-support for female-male equality that coexisted with a deep-rooted, full-blown misogyny. But also, according to Sharif Jemay, easily being understood as having only a veneer of misogyny and a more foundational feminist impulse of equality. Historically, anarcho-feminists have insisted on the gendered nature of capitalism and power. They saw that while even male anarchists would concede that patriarchy is linked to class, there also needed to be a fundamental understanding that experiences under capitalism are differentiated and inflected by gender. Traditional anarchism, or traditionally, anarchism relegated revolutionary anarchic work to the public sphere as if the waged workplace was the only place work and labor was being done and from which people had to be liberated. Anarcho feminists have insisted that the family and domestic sphere are also sites of valid anarchist conflict. Of course, the implicit assumption that all women occupied the unwaged domestic workplace fails to consider how black women in particular had an estranged relationship to the simplistic differentiation between workplace and home life because black women often worked in other people's homes, usually for white women. The task is to understand anarchism as always and necessary for anarcho-feminists, a feminist endeavor to bring down the patriarchy. This is not, as already alluded to, the reverse power relations. Misguided female empowerment type of feminism has no place in this political thought. Such feminism merely wishes to replace men at the top 1% with cis women. Anarcho-feminism doesn't mean female corporate power or a woman president. It means no corporate power and no presidents. Discourses of leaning in, feminist-friendly capitalism, and rights-based equality that permit non-men to insituate themselves into still-functioning system as is will not transform society in an anarchic way. Dismantling all hierarchies and authority means an anarcho anarcho feminist revolution. A solid encapsulation of anarcho feminism, particularly as it ends where black feminism might be said to begin, is an articulated in Fion Guala Nick Roy Bierd's twenty fifteen A Basic Introduction to Anarcho Feminism. Quote, we believe our freedom lies in the abolition of oppression in its many forms, economic, racist, homophobic, sectarian, and of course, sexist. Anarchists strive for a society that is community-based, where we make decisions over our lives and communities directly through a system of local councils and delegates. More importantly, we aim for a society free from coercion and oppression. With anarchism, there is no end goal. We will always have to keep an eye out for creeping inequalities and unequal power structures within interpersonal and community relations. Anarchist feminism is getting to, is gelling together of these anarchist principles and goals with the black feminist theory of intersectionality. End quote. Anarcho feminism necessitates necessitates intersectionality because of it in Roy Bierd's argument is the gelling together of anarchism and the and the black feminist theory of intersectionality. One might ask then, what role black feminist theory as a whole beyond intersectionality, which is not to be conflated with black feminist theory, nor is it the only contribution of black feminist theory has in anarchism. So wherefore out there black anarcho feminism, or would it be anarcho black feminism? We see a glimpse of anarchic strains of black feminism in the CRC's statement, but of what of those black women who affirm though their own anarchism? To this end, we must turn to Lucy Parsons. Parsons, a black woman who was born enslaved in Montgomery, Alabama on June 20th, 1848, was a vehement anarchist criticizing the exercise of dominative power. She called the working class to arms in an, in an intellectual and social ideology she came to by combining the tenets of socialism and anarchism. Social anarchism. This social anarchism, which by Parson lived, quote, examines the organization of society from the point of view of an anarchist, but also views self-determination as conceptually connected with social equality and emphasizes community and mutual aid. 
Parsons' anarchism was deeply committed to the poor, though this tended sometimes to border on a Marxian first class or class first analysis that reduced all oppressions to class oppression. Nevertheless, her emphasis on impoverished people allowed her to glimpse the plight of working women, which ultimately led to an analysis of how capitalism affected women acutely. Parsons in Willie J. Harrell's Jr.'s account was, quote, an ardent feminist. She was an adamant she was adamant about alleviating the most marginalized, poor working women from the burdens of capitalism. Her revolution was one that dissolved the state and capitalism, which necessarily for Parsons was a precondition, quote, for the creation of an anti racist and anti sexist society. Envisioning a world that was free of capitalist oppression, Parsons emphasized how important it was to condemn what she termed the robbery of our sisters. This is what we am this is what this amounted to was her belief, much like the Hombahi River Collective, that women were not free until women were globally, f- globally were free. We get Parsons' perhaps fiercest gendered denunciation of the capitalist system in 1905. In her speech to the IWW, she remarks, we are the slaves of the slaves. We are exploited more ruthlessly than men. Whenever wages are to be reduced, the capitalist class use women to reduce them. She demonstrates here how capitalism utilizes cis male supremacy to cut costs by way of women's labor. The devaluation of women's labor, not to mention the unwaged gendered labor in the household that helps sustain capitalism, makes women the slaves of slaves. To be sure, here Parsons requires castigation for the implicit overlooking of black women who themselves were literally enslaved in the plantocratic antebellum South and the conflation of unpaid labor that is part of the economic market to the condition of racial slavery. Uh, Frank B. Wilderson's Ruse of Analogy. This is one of the few times we see Parsons noting quite explicitly that quote we women are exploited more ruthlessly than men an acknowledgement that capitalism is fundamentally gendered that capitalism survives and thrives by leaning on cis male supremacy and emergent anarcho-feminism but there was often a notable slippage that parsons not to mention many male black anarchists committed as Irvin has remarked quote although there will definitely be an attempt to involve women and white workers Where they are willing to cooperate, the strike would be under black leadership because only black workers can effectively raise those issues which which must affect them. End quote. The juxtaposition between women and white workers to black workers omits black women in a ratio so worn at this point that noticing it seems automatic. Parsons never made any explicit connections between the capitalist oppression she railed against and how they specifically affected black women or other women of color. Not much about racial capitalism or the conditions of working black women. She also made problematic statements that erase the import of racialized identity, including her own, often taking pains to obscure and deny her African and enslaved past. She noted, for example, it is not because black men are black that they faced numerous oppressions. Rather, it is because he is poor. It is because he is dependent. Uh, It is because he is poorer as a class than his white wage slave brother of the North. For Parsons, white supremacy is not a thing unto itself, but simply the manifestation of the ravages of capitalism, a product of class oppression. It is imperative that anarchism and black anarchism be interrogated through a black feminist lens to avoid these kinds of slippages. Reading anarchic strains and extent black feminist texts like the CRC statement and noting the similarities in the end goals of anarchism and black feminism, namely skepticism toward the benevolence of the state, non-coercion, dismantling hierarchies, and the like may bring us closer to actualizing the radical world transformation we seek. After all, what good is an insurrection if some of us are left behind? Quote, J. Rogue and Abbey Volcano, Insurrection at the Intersections.
Black feminist anarchism borrows directly from the spirit of 1992 International Anarcho-Feminist Meeting in Paris, organized by the Women's Commission of the Federation Anarchiste Francois, uh, and commits to the anarchic anarchization of feminist theory and praxis by way of refusal of the totalitarianism of sisterhood. The discourse of a universal sisterhood has long erased the specificities of black women engaging in a cis white heterosexual middle class solipsism that assumed provincial experiences of certain women at the experience uh, as the experience of all women. Black feminism simultaneously interrupts this endeavor and on its own acts as a perpetual politicization of the gifts of the outside and unincorporable, allowing black feminism and anarchism to converse, uh, brings about the anarchization of anarcho-feminism by highlighting the shortcomings of much anarcho-feminism and the anarchic valences of black feminism. Black feminist anarchist Zoe Zamudzi rightly asserts that the analysis of black feminism has a particularly deep resonance with anarchist understandings of mechanisms of power, which similarly foreground a linking across all systems of domination. Both black feminism and anarchism share a deep skepticism or outright rejection of various mechanisms of power, which are all predicated not merely on a nebulous or materialized state or authority, but are always embedded in and imposed onto us by white, cis male, and heteronormative frameworks of organizing the social order. Struggle against authoritarianism as a firm pillar in anarchist theory and praxis is strengthened by black feminist theory, which promotes a shift in orientation away from a more fragmented conceptualization of struggle and toward the idea of struggles as interdependent. Oh, this is anarchism anarchically pushed, as it were. Long have black people been tied to a communist Marxism, uh, but such an automatic linking and erasure of black anarchists de-emphasizes how black feminist assertions of the interlocking oppressions befalling black women is an anarchic framework, or at least anarchism anarchized. There are resonances of this in classical anarchism his texts and thinkers. For example, Bakunin writes in his 1867 Solidarity and Liberty, the Worker's Path to Freedom, quote, what all, what all other men are is the great importance to me. However independent I may imagine myself to be, however far removed I may appear from the mundane considerations by my social status, I am enslaved to the misery of the meanest member of society. The outcast is my daily menace. Whether I am Pope, Czar, Emperor, or even Prime Minister, I am always the creature of their circumstance, the conscious product of their arrogance or ignorance, want, and clamoring. They are in slavery, and I, the superior one, am enslaved in consequence. Bakunin is arguing a radical position. He asserts in no uncertain terms that anyone else's suffering means that he suffers. Though he had a physical stake in many struggles, he did not, however, have a physical stake in every struggle, namely the struggles of the likes of the black or the enslaved peoples of the Western world. Nevertheless, he articul articulated a radical commitment to the marginalized and identification with the oppressed and marginalized even. Bakunin writes here essentially that until the lowest are free and unfettered by oppression that is, in the CRC's formulation, black women, neither he, nor the Pope, nor the Tsar, nor the Emperor can be free. His and others' freedom rests on the memory foam pillow of the freedom of the meekest. After linking this quote to the CRC's perspective on interrelated and interlocking struggle, Hilary Lazar notes the foundational anarchist principles of reciprocity, mutual aid, interdependence, and direct action are the quote mainstays in both feminist and anarchist practice. End quote. 
Samudzi is interested in the centuries-long lineage of anarchic insurrection that can be found on the slave ship, on the plantation, in maroon communities, up to more contemporary uprising against law enforcement, that white masculine arm of the state. She is engaging in historical theorizing of black feminist anarchism because imagining a radically transformed world is a deeply theoretical endeavor. It is a, it is an quote, incredibly theoretical exercise that is creating a community that is safe for black women, for black trans women, because that requires that we all have these conversations and start to create material politics around misogynoir and trans misogynoir around disability, around the relationships that men have with one another and the ways that they demand and hold one another accountable. Imagining something radically other than a society reliant on the state and its authorities requires thinking about a space in which black women across a range of gender expressions can be safe because, lest we forget, the state operates under the assumption of the importance of black women's safety. There is no way anarchism can do anarchism to the fullest if it does not heed black feminist theory. If anarchism seeks to actualize that world, it must focus on the plight of black women, as that is a nexus that holds precisely the very systems anarchism needs to understand and destroy. Samudzi goes on, goes in on capitalism. As a structuring force of contemporary society, Capitalism harbors many of the systems anarchists seek to combat, but black feminist anarchism's response to capitalism, Submudzi argues, needs to be described in the way that Cedric Robinson was describing it in terms of being racial capitalism, in terms of understanding that contours of capitalism being shaped by, at least in the United States or globally through colonialism, through the genocide of indigenous communities and the expropriation of their land and resources through slavery and in the United States, the afterlife of slavery. If we're not understanding specifically the ways in which economic violence is an extricably linked to the racialized violence and commodification of non-white bodies, then we actually have no understanding of how capitalism works. Though I would wager to say that this is implicit in Samudzi's argument, I need to also make explicit the, quote, indispensable role played by gendered, unpaid work in capitalist society that capitalist societies are also by definition wellsprings of gender oppression far from being accidental sexism is hardwired into capitalist society's very structure capitalist exploitation is experienced through and seeks out the vectors of race and gender bringing blackness and gender to the fore in discussions of the centralized regime of capitalism and governance gives anarchist analysis a more robust texture few black people and even fewer black women identify as anarchists because of how radical leftism has been mired in racist and sexist discourses seeking to dissuade marginalized demographics from finding coalitions that strengthen the possibility of their liberation the tone of this dissuasion was set, Samudzi says, by moderate black folks and the white folks warning <clears throat> black communities against radical outside agitators. Such warnings today harken back to the language that these white Southern lawmakers and politicians would use to prevent black communities from doing work with white communist organizers or anti-racist organizers. Her black feminist anarchism mends this wedge being driven into these politics to stave off interracial coalition building. Black and brown folks having a more thorough understanding of these kinds of radical anti-capitalist class interests is the aim of her black feminist anarchism and must be the aim of anyone's anarchism. Her way of living was nothing short of anarchy, writes Sadaya Hartman in Wayward Lives, a Beautiful Experience, Intimate Histories of Social Upheaval. What might anarchism be if we understood the small movements, the micropolitics, the quote, collective assemblages of enunciation that flows or flees, that escapes the binary imaginations, the resonance apparatus, and the overcoding machine, end quote, that brings politicality 
into play on different scales and in different forms of black girls as subjective anarchic enunciations of other modes of life. What could anarchism be if the go-to theorists were the various incarnations of Hartman's her, a black girl, We have a slightly altered definition of anarchy and anarchism in Hartman. What if we embraced it as our start to anarchist politics? She writes, to embrace the anarchy, the complete program of disorder, the abiding desire to change the world, the tumult, upheaval, and open rebellion is to attend the other forms of social life which cannot be reduced to transgression or to nothing at all and which emerge in the world marked by negation but exceed it. Anarchy is an open rebellion. It cannot be closed, nor should it be closed, because its openness is what gives its anarchic tenor for accepting the radical, the unknown that might arise when we all have known is dismantled. Tending to other forms of social life makes us attentive to the lower frequencies. That is, that is where something else might happen, something other than this. Conversing with Bakunin's assertion that within anarchism, quote, the passion for destruction is a creative passion, too. Hartman does not wish to dwell in the negation, the passion for destruction, but emphasizes how that negation is exceeded in what we ultimately hope for, to create something new. Like the ungoverned space of the undercommons where the doors swing open for anyone, quote, the beautiful anarchy of the corner where black life conspired to make the other things unimaginable, refused no one. In the anarchic ghettos where black girls played and lived, they moved to the rhythm of another groove of life. Everyone could stay here. This was truly non-hierarchical, non-coercive, inasmuch as they stayed here because they were permitted to the quote resist they were permitted to resist the pull of roaming, hustling, and searching. Those endeavors they felt compelled to partake in because racial capitalism did not want them to stay briefly to catch their breath. Here, gatherings were promiscuous. There were no criteria for entrance, only that you lived anarchically, which is to say you let the space fill up when you got there. And when you got there, filled with, uh, filled with the space, strangers became intimates because they shared the space and didn't matter where you came from, only that you lived with the anarchy that provided insight into where y'all might go. So what did untested militants and smug ideologues know of Sir Jonah Truth and Harriet Tubman? Unlike unruly colored women, they failed to recognize that experience was capable of opening up new ways, yielded a thousand new forms and improvisations. Truth and Tubman, black women knew a thing or two about anarchism because they experienced it in a way more notable than anarchists might not have, perhaps could not have. Definitely could not have. Well, they talked about the state in a way that did not seem to match how the state portrayed itself. Tubman and Truth made plain how the state got inside you and made you think anarchic thoughts, do anarchic things because you couldn't take it anymore. Their bodies theorized an anarchic rejection of the terrors of that are the state because they did not divide the state from the intimacy of their corporeality. They couldn't because the state was the estate on which they found themselves captive. The state was the man who came into their quarters and violated their bodies in the night. Perhaps they dreamed of but could not know another world because if it was indeed another world, it would necessitate the troubling, the obliteration, or maybe a subtler dissolving of the limbs of hegemony. These black women corporealized manifestations of, not reducible to, black feminism show that anarchism needs to expand its thinking, see where its kin lie by seriously recounting the struggle against servitude, captivity, property, and enclosure that began in the the barracoon and continued on the ship, where some fought, some jumped, some refused to eat. Others set the plantation in the fields on fire, poisoned the master. Anarchism's history goes there, where the fathers of the term did not think to go.
So black anarchism, anarcho-blackness and its attending, its embedded black feminism is a misreading of anarchist key text because, quote, only, misread only a misreading of the key text of anarchism could ever imagine a place for wayward colored girls. End quote. Mm. Hartman, once more illustrious, uh, in an illustrious anarchic prose on illustrious anarchic life and everyday choreography of the possible unfolded in the collective movement which was headless and spilling out in all directions strollers drifted in mass like a swarm or the swell of an ocean it was a long poem of black hunger and striving it was the wild rush from house service on the part of all who could scramble or run it was a manner of walking that threatened to undo the city steal back the body break all the windows the people ambling through the block and passing time on corners and hanging out in front of front steps were an assembly of the wretched and the visionary, the indolent and the dangerous. All the modalities sing a part in this chorus, and the refrains were of infinite variety. The rhythm and stride announced in the possibilities, even if most were fleeting and too often unrealized. The map of what might be was not restricted to the literal trail of Esther's footsteps or anyone else's, and this unregulated movement encouraged the belief that something great could happen despite everything you knew, despite the ruin and the obstacles. What might be was unforeseen, and, Im and improvisation was the art of reckoning with chance and accident. Hers was an was an inerrant path cut through the heart of Harlem in search of the open city, Leoverter, inside the ghetto. Wandering and drifting was how she engaged with the world and how she understood it. This repertoire of practices composed her knowledge. Her thoughts were indistinguishable from the transient rush and flight of black folks in this city within the city. It flowed of it and carried along everyone, propelled and encouraged all to keep on moving. A coalitional collective quotidian choreography of possibility. That is not anarchism understood in the traditional sense. That is not anarchism begotten merely by adherence to what Kropotkin has preached. It is anarchism that is choreographed through the way that we move and think about our bodies. Anarchic subjectivity in that we become into being through anarchy of becoming. A way to exist in the world where our, our existence is predicated on how we aid each other mutually, refuse the violence of the state, dismantle hierarchies, concede to a non-coerced ethic, not right with all its judiciary baggage of opacity. This choreography is headless, rulerless, without ruler, anarchist, and it spills out. The spilling makes it hard for the state to clamp down the movement. Such a black feminist anarchism cannot be contained by an inclusion into any organization. It has to be a modality, a manner of walking that threatens to undo the city, steal back the body, break all the windows because there is an anarchy. That is where anarchy happens, in the theft of that which should never have been property, in the destruction of the state, in the ultimate undoing of the miniaturized state the city. The quotidian is where it's at, and black women and black feminism alert us to that everyday life. In continuing to eliminate and inspire the quotidian struggles that black women must carry on to make a way out of, no way for ourselves and other black women and girls, the anarchic arteries of black feminism emphasize the necessity to I still tend to those discursive gardens which incite and move us to action and change and teach us the value of women's lives and living. We must ensure the life and livelihood of those small moments, those moments that sustain, that is lived on the margins in that assembly of the wretched and visionary. Those moments populated by the black and woman, the black and femme, the moments that glyphs some other way of life, the no way out of which a way is made by black women. This unregulated ambulatory movement flexes with an arrhythmic rhythm that reverberates on another scale, another frequency to which we need to attune ourselves. Despite everything we know and all the horrors that lay about us, the something else is what we look to cultivate through our movements and actions 
thoughts and desires, gardens and pots of food. There was something deeply at about the Dark Star Collective's decision to title their anarcho-feminist anthology, Quiet Rumors. Instead of the brash, anarchic exclamations of anarchists past, something quiet invites a whole host of revelatory tremors to unmoor instantiated ways of life that we might not hear it at first, but that doesn't mean it's not there. Working, giving us an anarchic world to look forward to, it is unheard and unseen because its sights and sounds have refused the structuring logic of the state and hierarchy. Hartman's she roams the world with a knowledge begotten by drifting without the rule of roads and paths there is a different city within this city a city that is not recognized as a city because it isn't one it is something else another kind of sociality an anarchic sociality where we can live free this has been a production of audible anarchist you can find more audible anarchist on youtube